Is the United States of America a leading terrorist state? Do the war in Afghanistan and American support of Israel prove that George Bush qualifies as a war criminal? Well, according to Noam Chomsky, America's most famous dissident, the answer is yes. We meet him in Cambridge to talk about many things, including his new book, 9-11. Now, in the hysterical days following the September 11th attacks, when George Bush reduced the world to two camps, you're either with us or you're against us, two voices of dissent distinguished themselves, first Susan Sontag and then Noam Chomsky. Both refused to buy into George Bush's reductive worldview, and they reminded Americans of their own government's criminal actions around the world. Now, Noam Chomsky is, of course, the MIT linguistics professor who famously popularized the concept of manufacturing consent. For years, he's written about how the West uses a propagandistic press to coerce its own citizens and how it uses covert forms of violence to maintain power around the world. Chomsky was overwhelmed with media requests about September 11th, so his new book, 9-11, is a collection of interviews that he gave in the following months. Now, interestingly, 9-11 has been a bestseller despite the fact that it's had a total lack of publicity. I met Noam Chomsky in Cambridge to talk about the post-9-11 world and how things have changed since then, but I began by asking him to explain how the war in Afghanistan is an example of how the U.S. is, in his mind, a leading terrorist state. So on October 12th, I guess, a couple of days after the bombing started, uh, Bush publicly announced to the Afghan people uh, that we will continue to bomb you uh, unless your leadership uh, turns over to us people who we suspect of carrying out crimes, although we refuse to give you any evidence, probably because they don't have any, uh, and uh, we dismiss without comment uh, the offers of your leadership for negotiations about extradition. And notice that that's a textbook illustration of international terrorism. That is, the, by, by the U.S. official definition, that is the use of the threat of force or violence, in this case extreme violence, to attain political ends through intimidation uh, and fear and so on. That's the official definition. This is a textbook illustration of it. Uh, three weeks later, by the end of October, uh, the war aims had changed. Uh, they were first announced, as far as I can find out, by the British Defense Minister, uh, Sir Admiral Boyce, uh, Admiral Boyce, the British Defense Minister, uh, he uh, uh, informed the Afghan population that uh, we will continue to bomb you until you change your leadership. Well, that's an even more dramatic illustration of international terrorism, if not aggression, uh, and that was the uh, 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 and that was the goal that was followed. This had nothing to do with uh, finding the criminals and uh, bringing them to justice. This is a totally different issue. If the United States is a leading terrorist state, if, as you say, Britain is another example of a terrorist state, how do you distinguish between that kind of what you describe as terrorism and what they are saying, Osama bin Laden, who's a terrorist? Make the distinction. Yeah, it's very simple. If, if they do it, it's terrorism. If we do it, it's counterterrorism. Uh, that's a historical universal. You go back to Nazi propaganda, see? most extreme mass murderers ever. If you look at Nazi propaganda, it's exactly what they said. They said they are defending the populations and the legitimate governments of Europe, like Vichy, from the terrorists, uh, terrorist partisans uh, who are directed from London. Okay, that's the basic propaganda line. And like all propaganda, no matter how vulgar, it has an element of truth. The partisans did carry out terror. They were directed from London. Uh, the Vichy government is about as legitimate as half the governments the U.S. has installed around the world in support. So yes, there was a minor element of truth to it. Uh, and that's the way it works. If somebody else carries it out, it's terror. If we carry it out, it's counter-terror. I, I think perhaps one of the most dramatic examples right at this moment uh, is a place where, where I just was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, southeastern Turkey. Uh, southeastern Turkey is the site of one of the, some of the worst terrorist atrocities of the 1990s. Uh, this is the Kurds. The attacks Kur on the Kurds. Attacks on the Kurds. Left a couple of million refugees. Uh, much of the countryside devastated. Uh, tens of thousands of people killed. Every imaginable barbaric form of torture you can dream of is all well documented in Human Rights Watch reports and so on. H how did they do it? Well, they did it with a huge flow of U.S. arms, 
uh, which ended up, which peaked in 1997, in the single year 1997. And that one year, the arms transfers to Turkey from the United States were higher than the entire Cold War period, you know, up until the insurgency started, the counterinsurgency started. But look at the way it's treated. Look at the way it's treated. This massive international terrorism run and supported by the United States is considered a great triumph of counterterrorism. So if you read the State Department reports on terror, they praise Turkey for its success in showing how to counter terror. You read a front page article in the New York Times, praises Turkey for showing how to deal with terror. Turkey was selected as the country to provide the international the forces uh, for what they call the international force for Afghanistan. Actually, it's for Kab Kabul alone. Uh, the, it's Turkey that's being offered uh, uh, is being paid by the United States extensively to carry out the uh, repression of terror uh, thanks to their achievements in countering terror, namely by carrying out some of the worst terror of the 1990s, uh, massive ethnic cleansing and atrocities, with U.S. support. Now, you know, this takes, a, this is a real achievement of the intellectual culture to be able to do this. Uh, but it illustrates very well the answer to your question, terror and counterterror. Uh, if, if some enemy state did this, I mean, we'd be, you know, not just outraged, we'd be bombing them. All right, when we come back, Noam Chomsky says that nations such as the United States and Israel should acknowledge their own crimes before talking about right and wrong, and he says a lot more than that, so stick around for more Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Let's talk about in the Middle East, for example, where Sharon says, we are experiencing terrorist bombings, and therefore we have to uh, have a big operation in the, in the West Bank and, and root out terrorism. And, and people say, hey, you're violating human rights. And the Israelis say, there's no equivalency between suicide bombings and protecting our security. And the Palestinians say, there's no equivalence between suicide bombings and the occupation. Th this is the 35th year of a harsh, brutal, and vicious occupation supported unilaterally by the United States, constant terror and atrocities. Uh, the, suppose Palestinians say, well, we're under terrorist attack for 35 years, therefore we have a right to carry out suicide bombs. Which is what they say. Do you accept this? Does anybody accept it? Nobody accepts it. All right, then how come everyone accepts the Israeli claim to be doing it, which is a much weaker claim? Because after all, there's no symmetry in this situation. They are the military occupiers. Palestine isn't occupying Israel. And this isn't just started now. It's gone on years ago. I mean... So does that, in your mind, justify no, the suicide No, of course not. It doesn't, it doesn't in anybody's so mind. So it invalidates both sides. Th those who defend suicide bombing, and there are very few, uh, have not, not, don't have a leg to stand on. Those who defend the Israeli atrocities, including the U.S. government, uh, most intellectual opinion, a uh, good bit of the West generally, yeah, they don't have a leg to stand on either, and, it's, and they have a much weaker position. We're back to Turkey again. Uh, so let's take the Powell mission. Uh, Powell is praised because he's such a wonderful diplomat. Uh, he succeeded in, uh, he went to Yasser Arafat, uh, who's imprisoned in a dungeon where he can't even flush the toilet, uh, and he extracted from him a statement condemning terror. Did anybody request suggest that uh, Powell should have asked Sharon to condemn uh, the Israeli atrocities? Did anyone suggest that Powell ask George Bush uh, to condemn the fact that he's been sending Israel uh, the Apache at attack helicopters, which have been devastating Jenny? But the UN's been con condemning Sorry. anyway. Oh, no, no. Did any, you didn't understand my point. Did anybody suggest, can you find a word in the press anywhere, or any, anywhere, that suggested Powell should have requested a condemnation of Israeli terror from Sharon and of U.S. backing of that terror from Bush? I mean, that's a thought that couldn't enter anyone's mind. But, and but the reason is it. because our profound commitment to terror and violence 
when it's committed by our clients and by ourselves that is so deep that we can't even think of the question. You asked us after September 11, one of your points is we ought to look in the mirror, we being America or the yeah. West, we ought to look in the mirror at our own. Was that a way of saying, look, people like bin Laden are angry at us for good reason? No, I'm not, in other words, is there a way to not, justify... That's not what reason? I was saying. The statement of mine that you just quoted uh, is a very conservative statement. Uh, in fact, it was articulated by George Bush's favorite philosopher, Jesus Christ, uh, who pointed out famously, defined the notion hypocrite. Uh, a hypocrite is a person who focuses on the other fellow's crimes and refuses to look at his own. That's the definition of hypocrite by George Bush's favorite philosopher. When I repeat that, I'm not taking a radical position. But I'm even, taking a position which is just elementary morality. But even if he is a hypocrite, and they are even not he, just, everyone. Okay, even Can if you f let me ask another question. See if just here's an experiment. Try to find a phrase in the massive commentary on September 11th, which is not hypocritical in the sense of uh, George Bush's favorite philosopher. Find one phrase. All right, but before, I don't think you can do it. Okay, but before I, I don't want to get Gnostic here and, and religious on it, but I do want to... This is not religion. This is elementary morality. If people cannot rise to the level of applying to ourselves the same standards we apply to others, they have no right to talk about right and wrong or good and evil. But let's talk about even in right. And look, there's nobody pure, but an argument has been made. I know that the U.S. has committed atrocities. However, they did oust a more brutal regime, the Taliban. There was that wasn't even a war aim. There, there was wasn't even a war aim. It wasn't even a war aim. But is that a moral thing to do? They did get rid of a brutal regime. There fine. was celebration in Canada. Good, fine. Let them bomb Israel and get rid of the a brutal regime there. Let them bomb Uzbekistan and get rid of the brutal regime there. You say the Taliban them, and the Israeli government are the same? No, they're not the same. They're brutal regimes. But let's go back a stage. The goal was not to oust the Taliban. That was not a war aim. That was a war aim that was picked up several weeks after the bombing started. Okay? Uh, or, and let's go back. S suppose that we... And uh, there are dozens of, like, list, long list of brutal regimes around the world uh, which ought to be overthrown, but not by somebody bombing them. Uh, however, let's go back to the late, late October, when the, after three weeks of bombing, when the U.S. and its British client... Uh, decided to shift the war aims to overthrowing the Taliban regime. There was a meeting sponsored by the United States in Peshawar, Pakistan, of a thousand uh, Afghan leaders. They unanimously condemned the bombing and said it was undermining their efforts, which they thought could succeed, to overthrow the Taliban regime from within. The U.S. is doing it just to show off their muscle. All right, now uh, you want to. So the question of whether to, over, to overthrow a regime, yeah, that arises. Uh, and I think the Afghans are right. Uh, regimes should be overthrown from within. And in this case, it was probably very likely that that would succeed. It was a small, uh, brutal group, highly unpopular, plenty of opposition to it, which could have been organized from within. And that's the way to overthrow a regime. If we want to overthrow the regime of Uzbekistan, now a great favorite, uh, but it happens to be not very different from the Taliban, the way to do it would not be to bomb Uzbekistan but to support internal democratic forces and let them do it. And that, that there, generalizes around the world. Now, Robert Kaplan, who writes about foreign policy, I spoke to him recently about his book, uh, Warrior Politics, and I, I put some of your points to him. He said about the distinction between the terrorist states that you call Israel, you know, America, and, and the terrorist states that America calls the Taliban. He said, I wish Noam Chomsky had been with me in Romania in the 70s or the 80s, just one of the seven or eight Warsaw states with just one of the seven or eight prison systems with 700,000 political prisoners. Adult choice of foreign policy is made on distinctions. The argument that Chomsky right. makes has no distinctions because there's a difference between the quantity and the kind of dictators that America supported and the quantity and the kind of things we went in in communist world for 44 years. Okay, so let's take his example, Romania, right. Ceausescu, hideous regime, yeah. which he forgot to tell you the United States supported, uh, supported right till the end, as did Britain. So the example that he gave is a perfect example, and it's a small example, because we support much more brutal regimes. I gave an example in southeastern Turkey 
uh, several million refugees, tens of thousands of people killed, a country devastated, that's rather serious. Uh, it's, uh, uh, nobody accused uh, Milosevic of that in Kosovo. Uh, East Timor, we, we supported, I forget, East Indonesia, Indonesia. was one of, uh, Suharto was one of the worst killers of the, and torturers of the late 20th century. The United States and Britain supported him throughout. Uh, he's our kind of guy, as the Clinton administration said in 1995. Uh, horrible atrocities. In fact, you know, when he came into office in 1965 with a coup, uh, the CIA compared it to uh, Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. It led to total euphoria in the United States and Britain, massive support when he carried out even worse atrocities, comparable atrocities elsewhere. Uh, the couple of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people killed then, hundreds of thousands later. Full support continued right through the end of his rule. Uh, in fact, continued past his rule in late 1999 when they were rampaging and destroying what was left of East Timor, the U.S. and Britain continued to support him. And I can continue through the world like this. Well, I mean, Ka Kaplan, it, Kaplan says that, it, that there is a distinction. That everyone's got some blood on their hands, but he says, ah, we have significantly less blood because what we are is blood. a soft imperialist, really? not it's, state terrorist. So like when we supported his example, Ceausescu in Romania right to the end, that's good. How about killing several million people in Vietnam? How about killing hundreds of thousands of people in Central America in the 80s, leaving four countries devastated beyond, uh, uh, you know, beyond, uh, maybe beyond recovery. But qualify but, the U.S. So, from no, their intervening it in doesn't. any other way? Obs look, nor does it uh, disqualify, bin, that, the fact that, that bin Laden is a terrorist or that, say, uh, the Taliban are a terrorist state, that fact doesn't disqualify them from bombing Washington. What disqualifies from doing that is even is even they were Mahatma Gandhi, they shouldn't do it. Uh, Kaplan's can't understand trivialities. The triviality here is that nobody's nobody except the ultra-right wing jingoists like Kaplan is comparing atrocities by various countries. What honest people are saying, this seems to be incomprehensible, is that we should keep to the elementary moral level of the Gospels. We should pay attention to our own crimes and stop committing them. This would be true even if we were killing one person. Okay, and it's even more true when we're killing millions of people. Let's right. bring it to the bigger picture then, just, just because it, the question he says we all agree with the Gospels. This is, and then the whole he doesn't. Whole, okay. He doesn't. But he, he says, certainly look, does. Is I believe in a Hobbesian world. This that, is what fine. he says. So is he the, saying the we should Hobbesian, overthrow the? It's nasty. If you leave people alone, they'll kill each other. Yeah. And that's why what you need, was he calls, is an organizing hegemon, an overwhelming right. power, which that is always us. Yeah, which is always us, he says. Right, because we, and, and why is it us? Because we have the power, and we have a massively subservient intellectual class, of which he's an illustration, which will support U.S. atrocities no matter how awful they are. But he so says example, this is real politic, that Chomsky's will, off in another land with his gospel, that he says, with, look, not, we, Forget gospel, I'm talking about the most elementary morality. If a person doesn't understand that, they have no right to talk. Okay? If you don't understand that you pay attention to your own crimes, you have no right to talk. He talks about Machiavellian virtue. Sometimes we do a bad thing to protect our democratic and our good D institutions and a just society. Yes. Now, how are we how protecting you... our democratic institutions by supporting mass slaughter in southeastern Turkey in the last few years? Was that supporting our democratic institutions? Was it supporting... Our democratic institutions? Not ours, but... Anybody? Would Kaplan argue that the nation-state has a right to use any means necessary to protect its sovereignty. Oh, then, then he's justifying Milosevic. He's saying Milosevic had, any, had the right to do anything he wanted uh, to repress the Kosovars in Albania. Is that what he's saying? Do we need a, a, a constabulary, a force, a, a central force? In this case, it's America, America because it's the superpower to sometimes use unjust means in the service of just causes. What are the just causes? What was the just cause in, for example, slaughtering Kurds in southeastern Turkey? What was the just cause? I what I was the just cause in supporting Suharto? 
uh, when he wiped, when he killed a couple hundred thousand landless peasants in Indonesia, uh, went on to become one of the biggest torturers in the world, and then destroyed, uh, slaughtered a third of the population of East Timor. What was the just cause? What was the just cause when we invaded South Vietnam 40 years ago? This is the 40th anniversary of the public announcement of the U.S. attack on South Vietnam, ending up killing millions of people, leaving the country devastated, is still dying from chemical warfare. What was the just cause? What was the just cause when we fought a war to a large extent against the Catholic Church in Central America in the 1980s, killing hundreds of thousands of people, every imaginable kind of torture and devastation? What was the just cause? Can I continue? Yeah, we were, the just cause for, for people like Kaplan is we did it. Therefore, it's a just cause. You can read that in the Nazi archives, too. All right, when we come back, Noam Chomsky's always controversial views on Israel and his idea for solving problems using international law. So stick around once again for more Noam Chomsky. Hitchin says we've seen the enemy, and the enemy isn't us. It's the Islamic fascists. They bears into fascists. They're we an don't enemy. want to live with them. We don't want to negotiate yeah. them. We must destroy them. Ergo, the war against the Taliban justified. The war against the Al-Aqsa brigades justified. I mean, he has a different distinction, but we see the face of the enemy, and we should do anything to root them out. How do you respond to that argument? I respond to that by saying that there are many evil forces in the world. Uh, if we want to stop atrocities, I think it's a great idea to reduce the level of atrocities and violence around the world. The easiest way to do it, simplest, is to stop participating in it. If we stop participating in it, we will already reduce the level of atro atrocities and violence enormously. And if we can ever reach the moral level, minimal moral level, of terminating our own massive participation in atrocities, then we can move to another question of what we do about the atrocities of others. And I think, there are, I think that it's right to deal with them. Yes, there is an enemy. There are people who carried out crimes against humanity. And there are ways to deal with crimes, uh, not by uh, 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 bombing another country and putting millions of people at the risk of starvation. That's not a way to deal with crimes. Uh, when the U.S was condemned for international terrorism in Nicaragua and then vetoed a security and dismissed the condemnation by the World Court, of course, uh, and escalated the crimes and vetoed a Security Council resolution calling out on it to observe international law. The right reaction for Nicaragua was not to say, we have seen the enemy and uh, we must destroy them, so therefore let's set off bombs in Washington. But if it's wrong for them, it's wrong for us again, by elementary moral standards. So we should ask, well, what was right for them? And what's right for, uh, which would be right for us? And I think uh, they couldn't do what was right for them because we blocked it, we're too powerful. But we could do what was right for them and we never even considered it because we don't rise to that minimal moral level. Let's take a look at the Middle East, but let's take a look at the facts. The facts are, uh, for 35, I repeat, for 35 years, uh, there has been a harsh, brutal, miserable oc military occupation. Uh, there has not been a political settlement. The reason why there has not been a political settlement is that the United States unilaterally has blocked it for 25 years. Is it supported by the entire world, including the majority of the American people? The answer to that question is yes. There is a political settlement that has been supported by virtually the entire world, including the Arab states, the PLO, Europe, Eastern Europe, Canada. Didn't Barack put that on the table? No, he do? did not. He did not. What this it is also supported by the majority of the American people. It has just been reiterated by Saudi Arabia. The U.S. has unilaterally blocked it for 25 years. What Barack put on the table, uh, the, the population doesn't know this because people like the Western media, the media in Canada and the United States don't tell them. Like, you can check and see how often you, uh, you for example, or others have reported what I just said. I don't, don't bother checking, the answer is zero. Uh, the Barack proposal in uh, Camp David in uh, 
uh, uh, the Barack Clinton proposal. Uh, in the United St I didn't check the Canadian media. In the United States, you cannot find a map, which is the most important thing, of course. Check in Canada and see if you can find a map. You go to Israel, you can find a map. You go to scholarly sources, you can find a map. Here's what you find when you look at a map. Uh, you find that this generous, magnanimous proposal uh, guaranteed, uh, uh, provided uh, uh, Israel with a salient east of Jerusalem, uh, including the city of Ma'ale Adumim, which was established primarily by the labor government and Clinton in order to bisect the West Bank. Now, that salient goes almost to Jericho, breaks the West Bank into two cantons. Then there's a second salient to the north uh, going to the Israeli settlement of Ariel, which bisects the northern part into two cantons. So we've got three cantons in the West Bank, virtually separated. All three of them are separated from a small area of East Jerusalem, which is the center of Palestinian commercial uh, uh, and cultural life and of communication. So you've got four cantons, all separated from the West, from Gaza, so that's five cantons, all surrounded by uh, Israeli settlements, infrastructure development, and so on, uh, which also incidentally guarantee Israel control over the water resources of the reason. Last comment. This does not rise to the level of South Africa 40 years ago, when I South Africa established the Bantu stands. That's the generous, magnanimous offer. Okay. And there's a good reason why maps weren't shown, because as soon as you look at the map, you see it. All right. However, that's the characterization of it, but let me just say, Arafat didn't even bother putting a counter-proposal on that's the table. Not, no, that's not true. They negotiated at Taba for. afterwards. That's not true. But w I, I guess my question is, that's if they true. don't continue to they negotiate... Did, that is, that's totally false. And, uh, that, that's and no not, part that's false? Not only is it false, but not a single participant in the meetings says it. That's a media fabrication. That Arafat didn't put a counter-proposal yeah, proposal on the table? They had a proposal. They proposed the international consensus. Uh, which has been accepted by the entire world, the Arab states, the PLO, the majority of the sorry. American... Sorry, they proposed a settlement which is in accord with an overwhelming international consensus my question is, if and is blocked talk. by the United States. All right, when we come back after this break, Noam Chomsky says that the United States is not only blocking Middle East peace, it's actually escalating the violence there. And who's guilty of these kinds of crimes? George Bush, Bill Clinton, JFK, Eisenhower, all American presidents, and a lot more. So come on back once again for Noam Chomsky. The problem that people look at now, the Middle East, is they say it's spun out of control. How do you get back to? First way we how get, get back. First way we get back is by trying the experiment of minimal honesty. Okay, let's try that experiment. If we try the experiment of minimal honesty, we look at our own position, and we discover what I just described: that for 25 years, the United States has blocked the political settlement, which is supported by the majority of the American population and by the entire world, except for Israel, virtually. I mean, there's some marginal exceptions. Uh, so for the first thing we do is accept the honesty to look at that. We take a look at Camp David, uh, and we see, yeah, it was the same. Uh, the United States was still pro uh, uh, demanding a Bantustan-style settlement and rejecting the overwhelming international consensus and the position of the American people. We then discover that the United States immediately moved to enhance terror in the region. So let's continue. Uh, on September 29th, uh, Ehud Barak uh, put a massive military presence outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, very provocative. When people came out of the mosque, uh, young people started throwing stones, the Israeli army started shooting. Half a dozen people were killed and it escalated. The next couple of days, uh, there was no Palestinian fire at this time, and this was all in occupied territories. In the next couple of days, uh, Israel used uh, Amer U.S. helicopters. Israel produces no helicopters. Used U.S. helicopters to attack civilian complexes, killing about a dozen people and wounding several dozen. Uh, Clinton reacted to that on October 3rd by making the biggest deal in a decade 
to send Israel new military helicopters, uh, which had just been used for the purpose I described, and of course would continue to be. Uh, the U.S. press cooperated with that uh, by refusing to publish the story. To this day, they have not published the fact. Uh, it continued. Uh, when Bush came in, one of his first acts was to send Israel a new shipment of the most advanced military helicopters in the arsenal. That continues right up to a couple of weeks ago with new shipments. You take a look at the reports from, say, Janine by British correspondents like Peter Beaumont in the London Observer. He says the worst atrocity there was the uh, Apache helicopters buzzing around, uh, destroying and demolishing everything. You know, this is enhancing terror. Uh, and we may easily continue. Uh, we can take uh, also, let me continue. On December 15th, 14th, uh, the Security Council tried to pass a resolution uh, calling for what everyone recognizes to be the obvious means for reducing terror, namely sending international monitors. That's a way of reducing terror. This happened to be in the middle of a quiet period, which lasted for about three weeks. Uh, the U.S. vetoed it. Uh, oh, ten days before that, there was a meeting at Geneva of the high contracting parties of the Fourth Geneva Convention, uh, which has unanimously held for 35 years that it applies to Israel. Uh, it, the meeting uh, condemned the Israeli settlements as illegal, condemned a list of atrocities, uh, willful destruction of property, uh, murder, uh, trials, torture, and so on and so forth. So right, now, okay. What happened to that meeting? Oh, I'll tell you what happened to that meeting. The U.S. boycotted it. Uh, therefore, the media refused to publish it. Therefore, no one here knows that the United States once again enhanced terror uh, by uh, refusing to recognize the applicability of conventions which make virtually everything the United States and the uh, Israel are doing there a, a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, which means a war crime. Just a minute. These conventions were established uh, in, in 1949 in order to criminalize the atrocities of the Nazis in occupied territory. They are customary international law. The United States is obligated as a high contracting party to prosecute violations of those conventions. That means to prosecute its own leadership for the last 25 years. If we had, if we were functioning by the Geneva Convention, who would we then prosecute as a war criminal? Would George Bush be a war criminal? Of course. Sharon would be a war criminal? Yes, they're all acting in Would brave. Yasser Arafat be a war criminal? He's a criminal, but not a war criminal. What's the difference? The difference is war crime has a technical definition. It's crime carried out by states. Would he be guilty of crimes against humanity? Probably. Yeah. He would. Minor crimes as compared with us. But Tony yes, Blair? Of, obviously. Obviously. Uh, most leaders in the Arab states? They're criminals, but not war criminals. They're horrible criminals, including the ones we support. Like all the states, we, every state we support is a, practically is a brutal terrorist state, which carries out crimes against their own uh, society, internal to their own society. But, the, but technically, those are not war crimes. They're just crimes. A very popular phrase now is Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. Book writers like Bernard Lewis say what went wrong, that in fact there might be a clash of civilizations between an Islamic culture and a Western Judeo-Christian culture. They resent us. There's enormous amounts of hatred, and it goes back in history but, uh, because of resentment. You want to know the answer to the question? Is which they, Bernard Lewis certainly knows it, but he's not telling you. First of all, he's not telling you what happened in the 19th century. Uh, he didn't talk about what Lord Palmerston and the British did to Egypt, for example. But let's be more recent. Yes, there's hatred against us. Why? It's easy to find out. The U.S. is a very free country. We have enormous uh, internal declassified records, so let's look at them. In 1958, the U.S. government faced, we know from internal records, three major crises in the world. Uh, North Africa, Middle East, and Indonesia, all with oil-producing states, all Islamic states. Uh, President Eisenhower, in internal discussion, observed to his staff that I'm quoting it now, there's a campaign of hatred against us n in the Middle East, not by governments, but by the people. The National Security Council discussed that question and said yes. And the reason is there's a perception in that region that the United States supports status quo governments, which prevent democracy and development, and that we do it because of our interest in Near East oil. Furthermore, it's difficult to counter that perception because it's correct. 
uh, and furthermore, it ought to be correct. We ought to be supporting brutal and corrupt governments which prevent democracy and development because we want to control Middle East oil. And it's true that leads to a campaign of hatred against us. Now, until Bernard Lewis tells us that, and that's only one piece of a long story, we know that he's just a vulgar propagandist, not a scholar. So yes, as long as we are supporting harsh, brutal governments, blocking democracy and development, because of our interest in controlling the oil resources of the region, there will be a campaign of hatred against us. Tell me, what state does function according to what you call the minimal levels of honesty? Is there a state? None. None. States are power centers. The only thing that imposes constraints on them uh, is either outside force or their own populations. So the United Internal States... Internal criticism, yes. critical dialogue. That's exactly why the intellectuals who we're talking about are so adamant at preventing people in the United States and Britain from learning the most elementary facts about But is themselves. it even possible then? If you say no state functions... It's like not only no possible, state. it happens. The United States, for example, is far more civilized than it was 40 years ago. Let's just take that. Uh, March 9th, uh, this March happened to be the 40th anniversary of the public announcement by the Kennedy administration that the U.S. Air Force is bombing South Vietnam. Uh, it also initiated chemical warfare to destroy crops, initiated napalm, started driving millions of people into concentration camps to separate them from the guerrillas who they knew they were supporting. This was all public. Did we commemorate the 40th anniversary? No. Why? Because 40 years ago, nobody cared. Uh, if the government announces, okay, we're going to start bombing another country and use chemical warfare to wipe out their crops and drive them to concentration camps, fine, not a problem. So there was no protest and no discussion. But now there's more pro protest yes, and discussion. Yes, because the country has gotten more civilized. No U.S. president today, or for the last 20 years, could conceivably do what Kennedy could do with total impunity 40 years ago. And the reason is because there was massive popular protest opposed by the intellectual classes, of course, who hate it. Uh, but it did, it led to all sorts of things, including opposition to aggression and violence. It also spawned the contemporary uh, civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the environmental movements, and all sorts of other things. And it imposed important constraints on straight violence. So, In so fact, we, that's so how we got rid of slavery. That's how we got rid of feudalism. That's how every step of... So are we moving towards an emancipation from these slowly. things? Slowly. There's You're optimistic over, about Yes. Over, over time, there has been agonizingly slow progress, but very real, always opposed by the, uh, state, by the uh, intellectuals who support violence and atrocities and try to justify them and try to prevent uh, the population from knowing about them. But fortunately, their control is limited. And therefore, and what, will, what will the state look like at the end? Would at the we, end? Yeah. It, well, well, the end is a long time. Okay, but, my but I mean, what would, we, what would we look like? At the end, end, I think states ought to dissolve because I think there are legitimate structures. But that's a long time. That's end. A, uh, but but uh, it is the end of the nation state that you foresee in the vision. I don't foresee anything. What I'm saying is that uh, as long as people, ordinary people, are able to free themselves from the doctrinal controls imposed on them by their self-appointed betters and mentors, uh, as long as they're able to do this, they'll continue to be able to struggle for peace and justice and freedom uh, and limitations on violence and uh, uh, constraints on power, as they've been doing for hundreds of years, and I don't see any end to that. Where it'll end up in the long run, I can tell you where I'd like it to, but I wouldn't even dream about that. The immediate problem is to free ourselves from the shackles imposed very consciously by the kind of people you're talking about who don't want the facts to be known and for very good reasons because if people know the facts they're not going to tolerate them so therefore you have to prevent them from knowing you have to indoctrinate them you have to tell them stories about how we're really good guys and if we use violence it must be for the general good because we represent uh, the course of history yeah that's the job of propagandists uh, for power and violence uh, and it's the task of populations to free themselves from those uh, kinds of controls and domination. Pleasure to see you. Always.
In the post-September 11th days, few people were as courageous as Noam Chomsky in asking the hard questions about American involvement with terrorism and then marshalling evidence to support his views. But to say that his ideas are controversial is obviously an understatement. Witness what he said about the nation state being an inherent terrorist state or his views on the Middle East. A lot of it's controversial. Now, his slim book, 9-11, is only a primer on his views, and it doesn't include his usual array of footnotes, which are always essential reading. Noam Chomsky's 9-11 is published by Seven Stories Press. Now, for a transcript of the entire interview and for a list of other Chomsky's books, or to add your comments to the discussion board, check out our website. That's newsworld.cbc.ca slash hot type. Now, our next Hot Type hour-long summer special will feature two writers who challenge Chomsky's views on international politics, the U.S. and on the Middle East. First, Robert Kaplan, and we'll talk about his book, Warrior Politics. And then the Islamic historian, Bernard Lewis, and we'll talk about his book, What Went Wrong. It's a real academic fight between all those three. You'll want to watch out for that. That's it for this week. I'm Evan Solomon. I'll see you next time on Hot Type.